All right. Um, today, we are going to look at everything from the Nunc Dimittis to the close of the service. So this is on page 199 in your hymnal. Um, in the first epistle of St. John, he comments at the very beginning that we have heard, we have seen, we have looked upon, and we have handled the Word of God. And he is referring to the fact that that the incarnation of Christ is a real event. One that is so real that the apostles have actually beheld and physically touched Christ. He's not like a ghost. He's not a myth. Okay? He's not some fable. He really is God in the flesh. Now, what's interesting is once the Lord's Supper, the distribution is over... Um, we sing the Nunc Dimittis. What we are doing is we are confessing this same truth, which has also been confessed by somebody else prior to John. And who is that somebody else? Simeon. Why? Well, because when Jesus is born, he is brought uh, to Jerusalem for the rites of uh, purification and circumcision. And... Simeon is there, and God has told him that before he dies, he's going to be able to see the Christ. When Simeon beholds Jesus, these are his words, okay, in the Nunc Dimittis. And he says, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Now, in our liturgy, we also go on with the doxological ending. I'll talk about why in a brief second. This is a canticle. A canticle is a hymn that comes out of the Bible, something that was normally sung, right? He makes this confession. You know, there are a great number of these, not merely the Psalms. Um, why? Because he is confessing that he beholds the redemption of God in his very arms. His words are quite specific in that Simeon recognizes he can now die in peace because the fullness of God's promises have been made manifest into the world and the Lord has kept his word and he has been able to see them. A word... Um, that ultimately is the salvation of God's people. That the Lord has, in the fullness of time, up to the fullness of time, prepared for the world itself. And before all, He manifests Christ in the flesh. This Christ ultimately is the light of the world. And he talks about Christ being a light unto the Gentiles. Now, the reason he draws the distinction between Jew and Gentile is important. Because what he recognizes is that the Jews were at least supposed to have known about the promise of the coming Messiah. Because they are the people in days of old who had received the scriptures, who had received the word of God through the prophets, you know, that, that said, there is a prophet, as Moses would say, like unto me coming after you, and you better listen to him. Okay? They were supposed to have known this. The Gentiles do not possess that in the same way that the Jews do, though it speaks to them. This is what Simeon is drawing to mind. The Christ is also the glory of the people of Israel, the, our Old Testament saints, because he represents the faithfulness of God and the fulfillment of God's promises. Um, when we take the Lord's Supper, we are actually receiving the Lamb of God who has come into the world in his flesh and in his blood. The same Christ that Simeon looked at, the same Christ that John beheld and touched, is the same Christ that we receive in the Lord's Supper. We behold the salvation of God by hearing sacramental words of promise for us. And just as God promised that the Christ would come into the world, 
would save us from our sins, um, has, you know, blessed us with the gift of eternal life, so do we hear the same promises spoken to us when Christ says, this is my body, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. These are not like um, uncertain promises. These things are just as sure and certain as the promise that Christ is going to come into the world in the fullness of time. These are absolute certainties. Because while we may doubt God's word as sinful people, God doesn't break his word. Because he is faithful, what God says will come to pass. All right, so, Simeon knows this is the greatest gift that God has given. John knows this is the greatest gift that God has given. And we are to know that this is the greatest gift that we are going to receive in this earthly life. We receive the incarnate Son through the sacramental power of his promised word. In this sense, we are included, you know, in, in the we here, right? Though it is, it is in forward in time instead of backward. All right. Um, let's see. We end the, uh, the nunc dimittis then with the doxology. Um, the reason we do that is because while the redemption, primary, the redemption of us sinful people primarily belongs to Christ, the whole work of the Trinity is involved in the work of our salvation. That is, Christ comes because he is sent by the Father. Christ then says you know, that he departs and he is going to send the Spirit to us that we might be renewed in heart and mind and believe. The whole work of God is involved in this. Which is why we sing this at the conclusion to the Nunc Dimittis. All right, are there, any, are there any questions on this? Any thoughts? Anything you want me to talk about at greater length? You can't possibly be as sleepy and tired as I am. I mean, maybe you could be. Yes. Uh huh. And then it kind of comes back to this whole circle. Um, were there, could they have chosen maybe something from Revelation or something that. Okay, we're, we're going to talk about that actually. You're, you're, you just, he stole all my thunder. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, actually, at, the, at kind of the close today, what I'm going to talk about is that each divine service is a living out of the liturgical year. That is, um, if you really understand the format of the liturgy, you will know that we begin in Advent with the opening of the service. And we actually close the service with uh, the, the resurrection. And there's a very specific movement that actually hits most of the festival days, the high festival days in the church, which are like Christmas, Easter, Ascension, and so forth. So I will totally come back to that, okay? All right, Jan? Um, years ago, before we had communion every Sunday, yes. one of the, our members was about at the church mowing the lawn and had a heart attack and died. And so Pastor Sam, I believe, had communion that day. So right. Yeah, and, and that's just it, right? So you go to your daily work, and you know you have received the fullness of what God has to give in this life, which leads to life eternal. And it really enables us to live each day with a good conscience and, and being unafraid, because we don't know what's going to happen, right? I mean, we, we, may, we may not be here next week. We may not be here tomorrow. And yet, even if we are not, we have received what matters most. And it, it ought to change the way that we perceive our lives and that we live our lives. Ruth, you were going to say...
right. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Ruth's comment was, um, you know, the Israel, okay, modern Jews who are distinct from the Israelites, okay, in that they're they're not really exactly the same group of people. Um, they mourn the loss of like the earthly temple, but um, they do because, you know, for them. You know, for the modern Jew, they're kind of in an interesting predicament where how do you get the forgiveness of sins when the forgiveness of sins in the law comes through sacrifices that point towards the coming of the Messiah, right? Um, for us, though, we recognize that, that the bringing to an end the actual physical temple itself is really an act of God's mercy, because Christ, God wants us to look at Christ as the last sacrifice. It's why, you know, it's, we always want to be talking about Jesus when we're dealing with people, but especially Jews and Muslims. Because they have a false understanding. I mean, okay, the, the non-believer, the unbeliever does too, but they have a wrong understanding of who Christ is. We want to help them understand the word of God in this sense. All right, so... That's the Nunc Dimittis. That's why we sing it. What's interesting, though, is that the Nunc Dimittis in the divine service is kind of uniquely Lutheran. It is found in a handful of liturgies in the early church, but not many. Uh, it shows up again in a couple of liturgies in Spain, and then basically just drops completely out of use. Um, Luther ends up bringing this back in um, to the liturgy early on in the Reformation. The reason he does is because he recognized, um, and it, it shows up in a couple of places, but not actually that often in the Reformation either. Um, he recognizes that it's really fitting. I mean, I'm not sure what would be more fitting than the Nunc Dimittis after the Lord's Supper. Right? I mean, here Simeon has actually beheld the Christ. John sees Jesus. What's sad, though, is that actually it falls out of use again until 1844, when Wilhelm Loa writes his agenda. Now, Wilhelm Loa was a German um, pastor who came to the United States who was in contact with C.F.W. Walther, who was the first, past, first president of the Missouri Synod. Wilhelm Loa was really interested in cleaning up the liturgy and getting good worship going again. Because pietism and rationalism had really wrecked good worship in the church. And he writes this book called The Agenda to help churches basically recover the liturgy. Well, this is what he brings back. The interesting thing is, after 1844, it essentially becomes universal in the Lutheran divine service. Now, again, it's not without historical precedent, but it, it wasn't, wasn't that common. Um, I think it, it's, it, what's funny is um, it's almost become an ordinary in the Lutheran church. That is, it's always sung, basically, after you receive the Lord's Supper which speaks volumes to its connection with what is happening. Right? So that's kind of historically um, its place. Yes? That's right. Yeah, and again, I'm almost surprised that this doesn't find a greater place in the church's liturgy. St. John Chrysostom has it in one of his. Um, I just, I don't get it. Like, to me, this is one part of the liturgy that just makes the most sense. <laughs> yeah, it really does, right? Um, 
Well, that's how it is, okay? And thankfully, you know, we have it preserved for us because it's a, it's a good way of helping to bring to a close the, the distribution itself, okay? And to help remind us of what we have received. All right, now, um, at this point, I, I want to take a short aside because um, the, the service of the, the divine service of the sacrament has essentially come to an end. We have the thanksgiving, okay, and then the salutation of the Benedict de Camus. One of the practices, though, um, that arises, one, or one of the questions is, when the sacrament is over and you have something left over, what do you do with it? This has been kind of one of the perennial questions in the church. Um, the earliest Christian communities would, would consume all of the elements. And that's actually what they would do. And the reason they would do that is because they didn't want, um, they didn't want to have to ask the question, what do we do with it if there's leftover? So they just consumed it all. Um, very, very late in Christian practice, I mean really late, um, they end up being left over. Now, it will actually rise, there, there will be several traditions that come up in the Middle Ages where they will keep the host um, later on, and then the priest would celebrate a private mass for the sake of somebody else, right? Somebody who had died or somebody who was living, and then they would use the leftover elements. Um, the Lutherans don't keep the elements because they didn't, they, you know, they knew that pastors weren't supposed to be like celebrating the mass privately as a good work. I mean, that was the tradition in the Roman church during the Middle Ages, right? Your priest, you had a priest, so your priest would do a mass for you because a mass was a good work in Roman medieval theology. I mean, it still is today. And then the priest would merit good works, and then he would bestow those good works upon somebody. The Lutherans were like, no, we don't want to do that. Right, because the, the 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 sacrament itself is a gift. It's not a good work. And so what did they say they were gonna do? They were gonna consume it, so there wouldn't be anything left over. So no one could do a private mass. There wouldn't be any questions about what do we do, they're just gonna consume it all. The interesting thing is in the United States, in American Lutheranism, that practice fell out of favor. And um, it did for a variety of reasons. But it is becoming more common that churches are moving back in that direction. Um, some of you may have noticed, after our service, we have actually begun consuming the elements after the service. Um, it's a good practice. It's one that sometimes can take a little bit of use to getting used to. Um, but normally what happens is the elements are put back into the sacristy. And then the altar guild will save a little bit. That's not a little bit the leftover. They save what's left over, but usually it's not a lot. Because we have a really good altar guild. And the altar guild knows how many people show up on a Sunday. Okay? Because if there was a lot of wine left over, I would have trouble teaching this class. Um, now... One of the, I actually had an altar guild meeting a week ago or so, and one of the questions was asked, why don't you consume it at the altar? That is a really good question. If you go to Wiley, Wiley will consume it at the altar. If you go to St. John, St. John will consume it at the altar. We don't consume it at the altar for a couple of reasons here. One is we have to reintroduce this practice slowly. Because, like I said, I mean, like half of Missouri Synod congregations are not consuming the elements after service. What is typically done is that the hosts are saved for a future service, and the wine will actually be poured out on the ground. The reason the wine in those churches is poured out on the ground is because it is the notion of um, the body being returned to the earth. Okay. I mean, that's a good practice. Um, you know, a number of the congregations I've been a, a member of over the years have, have had that. Not all of them have consumed the elements. But, you know, when you're reintroducing something like this to a congregation, it, it, you know, 
it can be kind of jarring if you see everybody consuming the elements at the altar and you're not used to it. The other reason, though, is kind of, and I'm not a pragmatist, okay, but there is a practical reason here. Occasionally, there will be quite a bit of, especially the host left over. It can take time to consume the host. It's easier for us to consume the host after the service, right? Because, you know, it would take potentially three elders, maybe four if there was a whole lot left over. We don't want to delay the service, okay? Um, this isn't like a secret cult meeting in the sacristy after the service, okay, or anything like that. So if you see that and you're wondering, I wonder what the elders are doing over there. We're just consuming the elements. Because then we don't have to ask the question, what do we do with what's left over? Or some people would even say, is it still the body and blood of Christ, right, if it's no longer being used in the distribution? We just want to avoid all those questions for the sake of con conscience. So we started doing this. We had been teaching on this. It's about well, maybe a year ago. Yeah, about a year ago at this time, we had taught some Bible studies, and I think I wrote a newsletter article on it. Um, but that's the practice, okay? And again, this is what they were doing in the early church. It's what they did um, throughout all the Reformation. Um, and it's, it's pretty common now, actually, in, I would say, about half of the congregations in the Missouri Synod. So, go ahead. Mm hmm Okay, yeah. Um, the comment was made, um, if there is an altar guild that's not like our altar guild, okay, that may not be as well acquainted with our practices, sometimes what they will do is they will take the wine that has been consecrated, and then they will mix it with wine that's not consecrated, which is not a good practice. The reason being is, when you think about it, this, this is Christ's body and blood. I mean, this is a really holy thing. And, you know, if we really understand what's happening, we're not going to mix that which is holy with that which is not. Yes, it looks like the same bread, it looks like the same wine, but they have been, they're, they're in two different realms. Because one has really received the blessing of Christ's word of promise that he is in this. Um, for this reason, you don't want to mix the wine. And you don't really want to mix the host either. I mean, you don't want to mix the host. And again, what do you do? Well, the best way to solve all these problems is to consume. And as our congregations, you know, again, we're just slowly recovering these traditions. Um, it's going to take, I mean, I'll be long gone before we recover all these things. And that's okay. It takes time. Um, but they are done for a reason. And, you know, um, that's why we do it, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I'm a little out of sorts this morning. Not too bad. I mean, you know. Ruth? Yep. Okay, so the question becomes, since the, the bread and the wine are given for you, does that mean they are no longer the body and blood of Christ for you after the sacrament is over? After, because remember, the sacrament has three parts, the words of institution, the distribution, and the reception, all of which constitute you know, the sacramental act of God coming to us. I, I couldn't say that that's the case, though, right? I mean, I understand the argument, but can it be made from Scripture? Well, only loosely at best, which, again, is why we typically say, you know, the, the Lutherans probably had a good reason when they reinstituted the consuming of the elements. Um, okay, so there you go. Uh, the one other thing I actually want to mention, I can't remember if I mentioned it. Did Pastor Welmer or anybody talk about the presentation host? Oh, they did talk about that. Okay, good. Well, again, the presentation host is a big host. Um, one of the problems 
and it's kind of a structural problem. I mean, it's not really a problem, but it's unique, where it used to be that the pastor would face the congregation on the other side of the altar. In American church architecture, though, um, the altar is put up against the wall. The problem is you can't go behind it, right? So you can't face the congregation. The presentation host is a large, larger host that the pastor can lift up so everybody can see it. Now, they would even use these if they were facing the congregation. Just be aware of that in case you ever run in. Like, if you ever went to the seminary in Fort Wayne and went to one of their services there, you would see this very large host. They just break it afterward, and it's put into the uh, ciborium with all the other hosts, okay? And then it's, it's distributed. All right, so that's the uh, Nuke Dominus. Now, the very next thing that we go on to is called the Thanksgiving. Um, this is actually a response to the end of the sacramental part of the service in its, in its sort of properness. The pastor is bidding the congregation to be thankful for the good things that God has done because of his goodness. That is, it is an appropriate response to the Lord's Supper, right? I mean, God has just brought us himself with his salvation, in, in, with his sacramental incarnational presence. This really is something we want to thank God for, not just now, but also throughout the week. Why? Because God allows us to commune with himself and all the saints in heaven, to receive week in and week out the forgiveness of our sins. The congregation then responds, and his mercy endureth forever. That is, we recognize that the goodness that God has given in this sacrament is an aspect of God's mercy. That is, his undeserved kindness and favor. We don't deserve what God has given us, but he gives it to us anyway. And he calls us to partake of it in a worthy manner, because we're not worthy people. But he says, because you are in my son, because you confess that this is the Christ, Receive the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And so we do. And get this. It endureth forever. What we receive doesn't like just grant us forgiveness, you know, until we go home and eat lunch. Right? That the Christ whom we have received is meant to be with us from day to day and from week to week. Which is why Christ says, do this as often as you gather together. Right? And that's why we do this. This also actually gets back to weekly Sunday communion. Every time the church would get together in the early church on a Sunday, which was the day of celebrating the resurrection, they would celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, that doesn't mean every single service we have has to be a service of the Lord's Supper. I mean, there is a daily office too, which fewer people will be able to partake of, like matins and vespers and these sorts of things. But when the body of Christ gets together... We want to receive the sacrament. Now, again, in, in American Lutheranism, that tradition had fallen out for a variety of reasons. Um, slowly, as pastors have been able to teach on it, you know, as it's become more customary, more congregations have been able to you know, reclaim this tradition. I actually think it will become the majority, in the, like the vast majority in the Missouri Synod at some point. Um, in part because it's bringing us back into line with the saints you know, uh, uh, in days of old, okay, because they were, they were doing it. Now, again, we don't have to. I mean, we could do a matin service here. It, you know, it's not going to make us, like, less holy if we have a matin service or anything like that. Um, you know, my congregation, when I grew up and a kid, you know, we, we, were, we had two services, and one week, one service was always uh, matins, and, you know, the other one was, would be the divine service. How many of you grew up in a congregation like that where you had every other week or... Yeah, I mean, a fair number, probably about maybe a little uh, half, okay? Um, but anyways, you know, the Lord's Supper is a blessing for us, and, and we want to understand that what we are taking here has eternal implications. And the congregation sings this, right? It's a very profound, profound thing. Yes? Um, you know, that's an interesting... Um, it's an interesting question, and you'd really have to do a survey to know. 
What I have noticed is that um, in those churches that uh, are contemporary in their music and whatnot, if they have two services, a lot of times one service will be a service of the word only, like a matin service or something like that. Or, you know, they may not be using the liturgy. But, uh, but then a lot of times the second service that they offer will be a service, a divine service. Um, sometimes that's not the case. I've actually run into congregations where they have three services on a Sunday morning, and two of those will be services of the word, and then the third one will be a service of the sacrament. Sometimes they will make the argument that because we practice closed communion, um, it can be sort of off-putting because there are two, two doctrines that people know about the Missouri Synod, and that's pretty much all they know about us, and what are they? We have closed communion, and what else? We don't have, no, well, that's, that's just kind of interesting. We have infant baptism. I was actually going to say we don't have women pastors. Those are the two things I run into more often than not when I have very interesting conversations or something like that. Um, the, the problem, though, is that we have to be careful about trying to see the worship service itself as, a, as like a missionary tool. Because the worship service really is for the church. Now, um, it is true that we want all people to be gathered here. But if we're going to have people here, what we really want them to see is the fullness of what we have to offer. Now, they may not understand that right off. Okay, They're probably not going to. How could they? I would say the challenge for us is to teach. I did this a lot when I was at Baylor. Man, I was constantly inviting people. I actually got one of my Spanish professors to come to one of our services. But I would always try and educate them a little bit about what this is going to be like before they got there. And get this, sometimes I knew it was going to be uncomfortable when the sacrament would be given and they would be left alone. So what would I not do? Sometimes I actually wouldn't take the sacrament for their sake. Because it can be kind of lonely, you know, being by yourself, you know, especially if you're not used to the liturgy. I mean, you know, there are lots of Christian traditions where the liturgy is just not either done well or, you know, it's a little disjointed or... Um... Okay, so for that sake, what would I do? Well, I would actually take the opportunity to teach them. To say, this is why they're doing this. This is what this means. It's the same thing where we, do, we just do this all the time. We, we want to teach. Why? Because ultimately we want people to understand. Because if somebody did not take the time to teach us, we would not understand. And we do it out of love. Now, it's hard because, you know, in America, we live in a culture that is highly autonomous. The kind of culture that says, you can't tell me what to do. How many of you ever heard somebody say that? You can't, I mean, this is like the American ethic, right? You can't tell me what to do. Um, that makes it difficult to have an appreciation for um, traditions that actually do tell people, you can't do this. When I teach confirmation, I sort of like to put it this way. Um, when you go over, when you, as a kid, get invited to somebody's house, are you, are you really, are all the rooms for you? No. There are places in a home that you just don't go to. Now, I don't have to tell most kids you don't just go anywhere in a house. Maybe there's a few out there I need to. I don't know. But, you know, there's a general sense that there is a space and an order to what happens here and that you're a guest. It's very interesting when it comes to uh, theology and Christian worship, we don't have that that notion of spaces. We just assume that everything belongs to us. And I'll give you an example. This is really interesting. This is about two years ago. We had um, a gentleman and his wife come, and they were not um, members of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod in good standing. They came from other traditions. And so I talked to them before the service. You know, I said, this is who we are. This is the way we practice the Lord's service. This is what we believe. 
we'd like to take the opportunity, you know, to kind of share this with you before you come to the sacrament. What I noticed was we had a very faithful elder who went up and actually said the same thing to those people after I had, so that I knew they had heard this twice. Well, it came time for the service of the sacrament to be celebrated, and guess who comes up to the altar with their two young kids? This family. Would you believe this? So I'm like, oh, man, they're really going to make me do this on a Sunday morning. So I was right here. I mean, I remember it. They were kneeling right here. And um, the mother was first, and I went up to her at the rail, and I said, you know, are you a member of the Lutheran Church, Missouri, standing in good standing? And I had made the communion announcement and everything. She looks at me. She said, no. And I said, you know, the Lord bless and keep you. And then I went to the Father. Man, you should have seen their faces. And then they left, okay? And then get this. After the service, <laughs> Pastor Wilmer comes up to me. And he's like, you need to make a house visit on those people. <laughs> <gasps> okay. I was like, really? Okay. No, no, no. So I do. It gets better. I, I actually drive over to their house. Okay, which took a little bit of work to figure out where they were from. Um, knocked on the door, and then one of the kids, I mean, they were pretty little, like maybe five, probably four, um, comes to the, the door. The door doesn't open. There's like windows next to it, you know, the long, narrow ones. And the kid's like, Dad, it's that pastor from the church. <laughs> so I'm standing there for like three or four minutes because I know they're inside. Right. <laughs> You're going to go to seminary. This is the stuff they don't tell you about beforehand, right? <laughs> um, so I'm waiting. Well, finally the father comes to the door. And um, mother wanted, I mean, she just was really angry. But um, so I, I tried to have a cordial discussion. You know, I talked to him a little bit, tried to ask, you know, what the deal was. And... Uh, this is what he told me then. This is the most interesting thing. This is why we practice close communion. He said, um, we believe that anybody who's baptized should be able to receive the Lord's Supper. The thing about it was they came from a particular Christian tradition that baptizes children. But you know who didn't have their hands out at the altar? Kids. This man didn't understand the very words that he had just spoken. Because if he really believed that was his confession, his children would have received the Lord's Supper. We take the time to teach. Because the sad thing is, most people haven't been taught, and they don't understand these things. And a lot of times, they don't even understand necessarily their own confession. It is hard to do. I get it. But we do it, and the reason we do it is because when people leave the altar, the one thing we want them to know more than any other is that they have received the sacrament in a worthy manner, and they walk away with the forgiveness of sins. And if we don't do that, then we haven't really loved those people. Because that's why Christ is here. And, you know, it's kind of... Um, you know, it's hard. It is hard to love people in our day and age. Because where you love, you will also be truthful. You can't be untruthful and love somebody. Right? I mean, can you do that? No, not really. I mean, that, that's, that's a, there, there's a disconnect between those two things. Now, we want to try and be, be tactful. We want to be really compassionate. I mean, you know, as much as I really was struggling to go over to this man's house, I, I felt bad for him because they didn't know, right? I mean, they, don't, they didn't understand. Um, it ought to cause us really to be loving with other people and to be patient and to try and teach as we are able. You know, we have to pray that God will help us teach you know, because have you ever been in a circumstance where you're like, what should I say? Have you ever been in that? I mean, I find myself in this. I'm like, I just, I I just want to know what the right words are to say. 
you know, we, we have to ask God, help me, help me say what is going to help this person eventually come to the knowledge of the truth. It keeps us humble. It also reminds us, you know, if somebody had not been faithful with us, we would be no different. We wouldn't know. Um, and thanks be to God that, that people are. All right. All right, so we'll tell other stories some other time. Wow. You know, you, you, you know it's, I think about those people. I still, you know, you pray for them. All right. Um, the, uh, the Thanksgiving then ends with this prayer on page, top page 201. And uh, the one that is the historic one says, We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through your salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same faith, through you and a fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Um, that prayer actually, um, and, and several others that are like it, actually come from Luther. He put this in, uh, which service was it? He put this in his German Mass. I think it's from 1526. Um, it was a compilation of sort of post-sacrament uh, prayers from the medieval era. Now, he emphasizes two things. The nature of the gift itself, that is, it is a salutary gift, one that deals with salvation. He then brings up the issue of faith, and living in love towards others. That is, the sacrament creates and sustains faith. It bestows the forgiveness of sins, which is why it's a salutary gift in this sense. It is one that gives salvation. Where there is a living and an active faith, there will be love for the neighbor. Which is why he, he then says, okay, that, that we want to live in love toward others. Why? Because God has loved us. And we are about to re-enter the world. And you know what? It is a loveless world. It is a sad, bitter, dark, angry, lonely, hurting world. You don't have to look very far to see it. God has first loved us in Christ. With a love that is just it's not even hard to imagine. Wrap your mind around. Who can? Right? He has loved us who do not deserve to be loved. And he sends us out then into a world to love other people. You know what? That means it's like, okay, Jesus wasn't loved. <laughs> right? Jesus is really hated. He is not liked. He is despised. I mean, it's bad. Well, you know what? Love in the biblical sense is an absolute commitment towards other people. Okay, in this divine sense. This is the kind of love that is manifest for us in Christ in the sacrament, and then we are sent out into the world to love others. Now, I know this, our loving of other people is the law. Okay? I mean, that is the law. Um, but we are the people who have been redeemed, and as redeemed people, what else are we to do than to love others? And so we pray that there will be a living and an active faith that will go forward and will do this. And we have such an opportunity to love the multitude who are unloved. Um, all right. Any, any questions on the prayer? Wow, I must be doing a great job teaching today. Okay, go ahead. Um, in this sense, relating to salvation is something that's helpful to keep in mind. I mean, it means good, right, and just, but um, it comes from the Latin salus, which means health or wellness. But there's a holistic sense to it in this kind of prayer where it deals with the nature of our salvation. Right, because in, it, we have been restored in Christ. And then we go forward and we love others. This actually, this prayer... Um, well, anyways, that's basically what I would say. All right, now, in typical fashion, I'm running out of time, okay, which is not surprising. But I want, I want to try and get through the end of the service, and then I'm going to say it twice, once now and once at the end. Next week, I'm supposed to start my study on the small catechism. <laughs>
But actually, um, I'm going to, prior to starting that, okay, the confession stuff up again, I'm going to continue with the section on the liturgy. Because I want to talk about liturgy and Catholicity. I want to talk about liturgy and the body. That is, we don't worship as disembodied people. We do things like make the sign of the cross, okay? If you're interested in hearing that, come next week, because I won't have time to get to it today. I was going to try to, but then I looked at it, and I was like, I got five pages of notes. There's just no way I'm going to make it through, and I've only got five minutes left, so I'm not going to make it through. All right, the salutation and the benedictus. This is how we end our service. The salutation, again, is the versicle responses that recognizing that a sacramental act is going to happen. This has happened in several places so far in the service. This will be the last one. Here the sacramental act is going to be recognizing that the people of God receives, receive God's blessing and they enter into the world with that same blessing. So, the proper versicle response for this is the Lord be with you. And then what is, what is, the, what is the church supposed to say? And with us, yes, okay, I can, I'm going to go home, I'm going to have a great day. Now, we can say, and also with you, I mean, it's fair enough, okay, but does anybody remember where that came from? Mm. Okay, it was, it was like three weeks ago. <laughs> Maybe it was a little longer. Um, there was a translation uh, change where... It was understood by some translators, okay, in the 20th century, to be more of a greeting. But it's not a greeting, okay? Historically, when these versicles were given, when the pastor would say, the Lord be with you, what he was doing is he was reminding the people of God, okay, that the Lord is with you. The Lord be with you. It's like, I, mean, I don't know how to, uh, yeah, Brennick? Okay, I could talk about that. I won't have time to talk about it today. Um, kind of, but not exactly. Um, there is a different origin for that. Okay, and maybe next week I'll try and hit it. Here what is being emphasized, though, is that God is actually with his people. Again, as a God who comes in merciful acts, he is doing something that we don't deserve, but he's doing it because he loves us anyway. And the people then say, and with thy spirit. Now, when they say, and with thy spirit... What they're meant to do is to remind the pastor, God promises to be with you in your office so that when you do something like say the words of institution, it doesn't depend on you as a person. It depends on the words that are about to be spoken. Now, the thing is, the pastor is about to speak the benediction. The pastor does not have the power within him to bless all the people. The pastor is only reiterating the blessing of God. That's why you say, and with thy spirit. Because it's God's spirit there. Right? Working through the word. It is as much for you as it is for me. So we always want to try and say, and with thy spirit. We have to get into the habit of doing that. And I bet in the next hymnal, I really hope they change it. Someone, there was a, I forget who it was, there was a synodical official who brought this up recently, actually, and said, when everybody, whenever a pastor says, the Lord be with you, nobody knows what to say. Right? Like, it's, you got, like, multiple responses. Right? We, we've done this to ourselves on accident. It was just, it was an oversight, okay? One that was kind of unfortunate. But what it actually has done is it's brought a lot of awareness to this in recent years, um, so, you know, again, be that as me. That's why it's there. All right, now, everybody, well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people sometimes wonder, why do we say, bless we the Lord, and then thanks be to God? All right, the blessing actually has a biblical origin. If you look at Psalm 41, 72, 89, 106, or 150, okay, if you can keep all those in mind, um, the Psalter is actually broken down into five books. Did you, how many of you knew that? Yeah, if you read through the Psalter at one point, it'll say the end of such and such book. So if you look, let's just say you look up Psalm 41. Um, 
Do you have it? Psalm 41? Oh, no, you don't. That's okay. Does anybody have Psalm 41? Oh, okay. Can you read the very last verse? Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. This is actually where this blessing comes from. Shows up in almost all the old Latin liturgies. Because what they recognize, okay, is that at the conclusion of the books of the Psalter, the psalmist asks that the Lord be blessed. Now, we don't use the word bless as commonly in this sense. But it's more a word of thanksgiving, which is why it follows the thanksgiving than the prayer. Because we are actually giving thanks to God for the blessing that he's about to bestow. Um, now, the benediction, since we're going to run out of time and I actually got to get ready for a baptism. But, the benediction. Um, this, these words are given to Moses to give to Aaron and his priestly sons to speak over the people of Israel. That is, God's people are to hear that the Lord is going to bless them. And again, these are all salvific. You know, this is primarily salvific in nature. Um, that, that the Lord will be merciful to his people. That the Lord loves his people. Um, after the Aaronic benediction, the very next verse is this. It says, So they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Um, that is, over and over and over again, we are reminded that we have been named in our baptism as God's children. Um, we want, as right before as we go back out into the world, we want one last opportunity to be reminded that we are a blessed people, that God's face looks upon us as a people who are favored, not because of what we have done, but because he has done something for us. We are a loved people, even in the midst of this horrible world that we live in. And we go forward. This isn't like some vague promise either. This is a certainty. I mean, God actually says, so shall the name of my, you know, how does he say it? Uh, yes, yeah, so shall they put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. We are the people of Israel. A lot of times Christians make, make distinction between like Jews and Gentiles as if, as if we're all like in one redemptive history and we're all like the spiritual people of Israel. That's not true. In the New Testament, the Christians, whether they be of a Jewish ethnic origin or of a Gentile origin, they are all the spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel believes in God as God reveals himself to the world. We are the children that Moses is talking about. Okay, now, there is a triple amen. I know, we're going long. Okay, it's bad. Okay, I'm going to end on this, all right. There are three things that are stated. The Lord bless you and keep you. That's number one. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. That's number two. And then the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We have a triple amen because each amen is assigned with one of those promises. Did you know that? That's why you say that. Yeah, now you know. Isn't that great? Amen, amen, amen. Why? Because we are blessed. Okay? Yeah, it's great. All right. Now, we're going to have to end with a quick blessing because I actually need to get ready so I don't run out of time. All right. So, let us uh, receive a blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.